So Kaushik has been our resident at AIMS, and he was an exceptionally uh, good resident who had very good surgical skills, and he'll be talking about what he feels is the best to do in high myopes. Hello everyone, welcome to Kolkata. So this is the city of joy and I know you will uh, enjoy visiting the places and your food here. So I will be uh, discussing uh, the challenges in retinal surgery in high myopia. So basically I will uh, discuss anatomical variations, challenges and how to manage those case things. So anatomical variants, variations are that these eyes have unusually long axial length, the retina is thin, the sclera is thin, the muscles are thin and even conjunctiva is thin. The architecture of sclera may be anomalous and fundus is depigmented, contrast is not there, RP pump is poor and there may be a strong anomalous vitreoretinal adhesion, there might be vitreous hysis. Vitreous base is usually posteriorly shifted, there is, uh, there is posterior staphyloma and optic nerve may be already compromised, internal limiting membrane may be thin and fragile. And specifically these eyes might have had previous reparative surgeries including multifocal IOS, some of these eyes may be one or non uh, there might be glaucoma and as we all know they have high risk of giant retinal tear, retinal detachment, uh, myopic tracts and maculopathy. Visual potential can be uh, limited because of structural and functional problems and many of these cases patients are fake young patients and some cases have really thin retina with chronic retinal detachment. Some cases pupil might not dilate well and as I showed because the contrast is poor, break detection might be difficult and uh, CNBM, myopic CNBMs can be really very difficult to uh, see and myopic traction maculopathy also it is very difficult to detect clinically unless you do an OCT. So in buckling, the tissue might be so thin that there might be uh, globe perforation while uh, you are doing block or you are suturing the sclera, uh, passing the needle through the, through the sclera. And rectus muscle may be damaged or disinserted and uh, in some cases because I, uh, the speculum can go behind the globe and there might be severe pain and globe luxation during the surgery buckling is, itself. During partial vitrectomy, there uh, the sclerotomy is might leak when we remove the sclerotomy and reaching retinal tissue might be difficult with the standard uh, length uh, instruments. Induction of PVD and also the progression of PVD anteriorly is difficult and anterior vitreous base may be, uh, dissection might be difficult in fake patients. So uh, visibility of internal mem limiting membrane is poor and Myopic traction maculopathy or uh, pubiosis may deru and uh, while operating macular hole, the ILM flap may get uh, lost. Because the globes are larger, they might need higher amount of uh, silicon oil. Silicon oil may not tamponate because they are in the posterior staphyloma where the areas are irregular. And subretinal fluid may resolve late. So PVR, chances of PVR might be high and supra in such cases might develop supracordial hemorrhage also. So how do I manage my cases in scleral buckling? So try to hold with non tooth forceps, conjunctiva and avoid cheese wiring. Pull the muscles gently and avoid obviously thin areas or staphylomotor areas while passing the needle. So in sclerotomy, we are using scler uh, small gauge, 25 gauge. You can put the wound at a little posterior to the uh, limbus because the aura is a little posterior and the entry may be biplanar or triplanar. Long and uh, long entry will help this help seal the uh, sclerotomy. And if it is leaking, if there is a uh, doubt, definitely suture. It will resolve in vehicle 70. So <coughs> whether there will be difficulties, you can ascertain by getting axial length or and axial length also helps because these cases most likely will need cataract surgery later and ultrasound helps you to know the uh, anatomy of the posterior staphyloma. We, we, uh, what we do when, when I you know, cannot reach, I usually remove the trocar and cannula and enlarge the wound and go through the same instrument, same low gauge, inst uh, small gauge instruments. You can use 20 uh, gauge instrument also. 
sometimes you can depress the sclera at, at your working end and then you can try to reach the thing but that actually distorts the cornea and uh, limits the view specialized long long straight or carved instruments are available from uh, made one and the uh, distance angle between the superior two sclerotomies can be increased to help in maneuvering so P for PVD induction, definitely transluminal is needed and vitrocytosis might be there. You might need to uh, repeat the staining again. And I do it with uh, 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 irrigated contact lens, magnified uh, post for posterior view. The sometimes silicon tip extrusion cannula or internal limiting membrane uh, forceps or MBR blade may be needed to uh, insert the PVD. So during injection of the uh, dye, there might be retinal damage, inject slowly, and there are special instruments including uh, drip droppers and dual bore convolutions. Uh, and uh, these cases need staining and it need to be kept longer because the uh, mac macula itself, they might be very much deep and pigmented and if we do not stain, then it will not be visible. It will be very difficult and sometimes uh, we can stain under air. To prevent injury, we should start wanting diameter aeropharmophobia. And if to initiate the ILM pill, uh, we can use a DDMS or a penis loop. So if you start from superiorly, the uh, instruments themselves can uh, place a shadow or hell, uh, reduce the visibility. And because these are uh, long eyes, you, you'll have to uh, lift the flap a bit more. If there is retinal detachment, you can use PFCL and then uh, try um, PFC as the third hand, and uh, it will help your uh, island peeling. Some illuminator filters are available for better visualization, but they might reduce the visibility also. So intraoperative op optical coronary tomography is there, which will help whether the uh, help to know intraoperatively. 3D visualization systems are also promising. In phobiosizes to prevent macular hole, we can do phobia sparing island peeling for macular holes. Large macular, even large macular holes, inverted island flaps can close the hole. And other uh, newer modalities which I have not tried is platelet rich plasma, autologous blood, or other tissues, including retinal tissue or MD membrane graft. So, my take home message will be place sclerotomies literally posteriorly. You can remove the cannulas and mildly enlarge the wound to uh, get reach of the posterior pole, stain the vitreous and ILM, and if repeat if needed, keep it longer time. Use posterior pole uh, lenses and definitely patience is needed. Do not hurry because thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik, for a nice talk. So, uh, well, have you? Uh, I would like to just add over here. So, in cases when we are not able to reach the posterior pole, so as he said, that some of the things that we can do is probably that we can make cannulas, uh, the, the ports at 4mm, what we can do is that we can probably go even beyond that. So the larger eyes would have a uh, limbus to aura distance of more than 4mm. So we can probably make one port, indent and see where exactly is the aura. And then we can make a port which is at maybe 5mm, which is still safer. But then we'll be able to go to the posterior pole. So that is one more difference that we can make, apart from the ones he said that we can indent the sclera and we can do a 20 gauge instrument. Uh, Dr. Anand, would you like to add something? Hi, yeah. That I think is more. 5 mm, the problem also is that the base sometimes can be thin, and you can also create a dialysis if you go a little posterior. So that's the only little caution I'd add. But other thing is true, you have to uh, indent a bit. Okay, and this is one place where uh, those lenses help, where you don't have a sharp because otherwise your instrument is almost vertical and it's touching the biome lens. So having these posi especially if you have to tackle myopic traction macular or macular disorder, this is a detachment is fine, but otherwise if you're doing posterior pathology, then having a posterior lens uh, helps a lot. And Dr. Kaushik, would you say anything about, did you have any uh, problem in finding the break in such high myopes? Yes. It anything is that you'd like to add? Uh, it is actually difficult. Uh, so preoperative workup will be extremely important and definitely do indirect ophthalmoscopy with indentation. And uh, sometimes if laser is not coming, you can use cryo. So that helps. That is also why I did not mention. But if you are, laser is not coming, do, just do cryo. It will work. Okay, so if you're not trying to, uh, if you're not able to see the break because of the contrast that you have, then what you can do is probably inject 
uh, subretinal uh, BBG or a dye and then try to look from where exactly it is coming out. So that is called the Schlereins effect and that can also help you find the break so that then you can probably laser that break because if you're not laser the break then the high chances that you'll have a redetachment. Anyway, so thank you. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you sir. Kaushik, for such a great talk. I invite uh, Professor Parijad. He's been my teacher. He's a name and, author name and authority in <coughs> ROP. And he'll be speaking on VR surgery and retinopathy of prematurity. So thank you, Dr. Shore, for inviting me to this course. And uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here in Calcutta. So I'll be talking about vitreal surgery. In some cases, I'd like to show you and some basic concepts. Uh, so we understand that the benefits of early ROP surgery, you want to operate when there's an early TRD and you don't want to wait till, you know, the TRD is, uh, you know, progressed, is bleeding. Why? So you want to operate in cases like this where the TRD is low, where, where there's less peripheral TRD, it's easy to remove, uh, the macula is spared, there's less neovascularization. In all these cases, you would be able to do a lens sparing surgery with easy instrument access and good traction relief. And that will really help to uh, deal with this case. So if you want to deal with the cases like this, these are much beyond what, you know, uh, easy stage for ROP surgery can be and the outcomes can be very unpredictable. So you want to go in early, that is the key message here. Second key message here is that you want to operate both of these cases bilaterally, especially if both of them got surgery uh, requiring stage 4A ROP in both the eyes. Why is this important? Because uh, the most critical step is high-risk GA. You can do it in the same setting. And earlier what we used to do, we used to operate the worse eye and by the time we used to get to the next eye, the better eye used to become worse. So now it's better to do operate both the eyes simultaneously. It helps in timely management of both the eyes and allows uh, risk to single high-risk GA. Obviously you have to treat the other eye like a second independent surgery, which means you have to change the gloves, change the instruments, change the fluids and then do it. And parent counseling is obviously very important. Just the basic principle of how to do it. So there are three types of uh, tractional forces which are actually working here. So one is the centripetal uh, force, which is trying to create this falciform fold and trying to pull the TRD towards the disc. So you want to relieve that. You want to relieve the vertical traction, which is trying to pull it towards the lens. And you want to remove the circumferential traction, which is trying to bring this together and create a falciform fold. So same case I'm trying to show here. So this is a lens sparing 25G uh, vitrectomy which is happening here. So you see this fold which is trying to form here. This vitreous band is here. First you cut that so that the macula can be freed. A localized PVD is done there. Then this traction is relieved over the TRD. So you see the bleeding is happening there just because, you know, the blood vessels are growing into the vitreous. So that is natural that it's going to bleed. So the idea is to uh, uh, remove all the traction. So you can easily uh, cauterize all these bleeders. The idea is not to leave any bleeder there and wait for it to clot itself. The idea is to cauterize all of them so they don't bleed later. And now you can see all the three types of traction which I showed in the photo have been relieved and that is the end point of this surgery. Here's another case which you see again, here is a 25G surgery. Now the, here the uh, traction is more in zone one. So it's a zone one uh, stage for ATRD which you see here. So you see how yellow the vitreous is looking right now. So the traction is relieved there. The, the, here you can see fresh laser marks are there. So these are given prior to surgery, just before starting it, so that you can approach the periphery with laser effectively, which is sometimes not possible when you do it intraoperatively. So again here, the posterior PVD and everything is done, and this is how it looks like at four weeks, and you can see the whole traction, everything is gone, and this is stable. But even this case, if you see, is much beyond what uh, is advisable for surgery for a good outcome. Sometimes you get cases like this where you see a lot of uh, fibrous fronds are stuck behind the lens. So again, you have to be very careful in this case because if you uh, are not careful, you can go and injure the lens and uh, doing a lensectomy is a very bad idea in these cases. So uh, remove the traction as much as possible. Uh, you see a lot of these vascular fronds are going behind the lens. You can diathermize all of these vessels. And once you do that, you can then easily cut all of them and the traction will be relieved and the TRD will fall back. So obviously, it's just a superior TRD which you see here. And here, you know, you don't need to mess too much with the thing behind the lens. Once the fibrous supply, vascular supply is cut off, that will atrophy by itself, and very small remnants will be left there. Sometimes you get cases like this, where you see this is a case of laser aggressive ROP, where you see a lot of this traction is happening in the periphery, and there's a PVD, and there's a central membrane which is happening. So for posterior cases, sometimes you find that 27G uh, vitrectomy works very nicely. A quick in and out procedure is done. And, um, you know, so here we can just uh, do uh, posterior uh, cutting of all this membrane, relieve it from the traction which you see on the left side. So it's good for posterior procedures because if you try to go too much in the periphery, the instruments tend to bend and then it might lead to a, uh, some issue there. So it's better to do it if you want a very quick small procedure, just a 10 minute and out procedure if you do things like this in this case. So many times you will find cases which you get like this in which you see uh, in this case it's already lasered, there's extensive neovascularization and a TRD is happening and it's continuing to progress. 
So now in these cases, if you just do a vitrectomy and leave it, you know, then there's a high chance you'll have intra-op bleeding, high chance you'll have post-op bleeding, and a very high chance that the contracture of the TRD will continue to proceed uh, despite your surgery. So in these cases, we like to combine anti-VEGF along with this procedure. So I'll just show you this case. Again, a lens sparing 25G vitrectomy is happening here. So what you see here again is that this TRD is there and the traction is being relieved. Again, you see yellow vitreous, everything is being removed here. The traction is relieved all over the TRD so that this TRD can fall back and does not progress further. And once you remove all this traction, uh, posterior PVD is being done here. You can see the wave of fluid is going there. And um, then I'm just pinching, pinched it here to show you how vascular this tissue looks like and how neovascular the component is. And now the air is going in, and the end of this surgery, I'm going to inject half-dose lucentis into this eye. So now you can see with the green tip cannula here, half-dose lucentis is going into this eye. And so this is the kind of outcome which you get. So this kind of outcome is not possible by surgery alone. This kind of outcome is not possible if you give an anti vegf alone because it's going to go into a contracture. So uh, if you combine both of them, then it works very nicely. And uh, then the, you see how clean the TRD has vanished, and that is the outcome which you can achieve if you uh, do this kind of surgery. Here's another case of aggressive ROP with macular hemorrhage. So you see this case came to us. You see already a kind of a um, macular pucker is happening beneath the hemorrhage. So fresh laser marks again you can see have been given just prior to surgery. You can see the loops of the aggressive ROP. All this hemorrhage is removed. And you can see this membrane. So uh, better idea not to peel the membranes over the disc. A large TRD can happen and physically the folds are separated. And then you can have something like this uh, in the end and the macula opens up because of its uh, memory. And it turns out nice in this case. Sometimes, you know, what happens is that, uh, that uh, it's a stage 4B sequelae where, you know, everything is stuck behind the lens in the periphery. Now, you cannot go through the posterior approach. So this is a clear coronal approach. And after the lensectomy, you know, this membrane is there, which is a mixture of the posterior capsule as well as the retrolental membrane. So opening can be made in the retrolental membrane using an MVR, as you see here. But you have to be very careful because all 360 degrees just behind this membrane, the retina is attached. And if you create a break, the whole retina is going to balloon up here. So the uh, idea is to make a large opening so that uh, it does not close back again and the TRD does not continue to close. So here you can see that 360 degree TRD is there, the macula is dragged, lifted, and a shallow uh, RD is there all around. And this is what it looks like. And finally, this is a case of stage 5 ROP. So uh, you see this is unfortunate that you know we get around 10 cases like this every week coming to RP center. Uh, all of these are potential medical legal cases. Um, they have never been screened. So we do attempt to do surgery in some of these cases. This is a hybrid vitrectomy, which you can see is happening here. So here you can see this 23G MBR goes in, through which 25G instruments go in. So this provides a snug fit as well as maneuverability of these instruments. So after the lensectomy and posterior sinica release, uh, now what you see here, so this, these cases are left for blind. I'm just trying to show you this is a very simple case. It's an open, open funnel configuration on ultrasound. We're just opening the funnel. You see there's not much tissue, just simple fibrous tissue is there in the middle of the funnel. And I'm just using a simply a cutter to dissect it. It might not be so easy in other cases, but I'm just showing you one of the simpler cases here. And you see the last bit of tissue which goes away. There you can see the disc is there, and there you can see the post attached posterior pole you can see there in the periphery. So this is uh, how it comes like. And here you see that uh, in the end what we do is inject air in the end, and we do uh, closure of the ports. Uh, hydrate the ports and sutureless closure happens. So this is what it looks like. So what I'm not trying to tell you is that stage 5 ROP is, uh, has good outcome. Stage 5 ROP has universally very poor kind of outcome. Well, however, what I'm trying to tell you is that once you start opening the funnel, sometimes the funnel does tend to open up. For people who operate PVR D3, they know once you start peeling the center, suddenly the funnel starts to open up. Similarly, in this case, if you start to open up, it's not that every case will open up, but many cases might open up to a significant degree. And if they do open up, then, you know, uh, it provides navigable vision to the child. It allows the child to go from this place to the toilet, and empowers the child, and empowers the family. And the child is no longer dependent. So therefore, surgery should be attempted in stage 5 ROP. Although the outcome, we don't expect the child is going to read, but if he gets navigable vision, it will totally change the life of the child and the family. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for the great talk and the great videos. So i just like to add over here that whenever you go in for a surgery for ROP, you have to have a good planning. So you should do first a good clinical examination where exactly the traction is. If not, if it's not visible, at least in ultrasound to see where, because you're going to make these ports and these made ports have to be planned beforehand. So one thing is that 
And apart from that, sir, would you like to say what kind of an intraocular pressure we maintain during the surgery? Because it's not as... Yeah, so uh, I like to maintain around 10 to 15 BGFI. But if you'll see in these very small eyes, if you do even 15, you will see the disc turns totally white. So the VGFI, which we normally use for adult eyes, you know, does not work in these very small eyes. Even at 10, you will find that the disc is totally white. So therefore, I think uh, you have to work, if you work at very low pressure, again, it's very difficult to operate. So I like to work at around 10 to 15 millimeters of the VGFI. But what I like to do in the end of the surgery is then I like to pinch the cannula. So if you pinch the cannula, the pressure of the VGFI goes away, and then suddenly you feel that, the, you know, the disc pressure will come back, and a lot of bleeders will come out, which otherwise you will not see if you work under the VGFI. So that will avoid a lot of post-operative bleeding in your cases if you pinch the cannula before you uh, close the case. Sir? So uh, uh, the case which I showed, I did it intraoperatively. It, uh, it was very highly vascular. And uh, yeah, so if I you go close, it will bleed. Yeah, so uh, uh, this was done at the end of surgery under air. So I injected half lucentis in this. In, no, intraoperatively. I injected intraoperatively lucentis in this case. So the result which I showed you, we combine it in the same procedure. You don't give free. We don't give pre. We don't give pre in this case. In this case, we are given intraoperatively. Actually, you know, if the case is so bad, if a TRD stage four TRD is so bad that it, you know, uh, needs anti-VEGF prior to the procedure, there's a high chance it might, you know, contract uh, if you give anti-VEGF, and then you know it might become even worse uh, for surgery uh, if you just go with a pre of anti-VEGF. So it might work in a little earlier cases where you know small fronds, threshold ROP, where you know you want to avoid surgery, it might work that way. But otherwise, it won't. Crunch is a big problem if you go in. Thank you, sir. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Devesh. He is a uh, faculty uh, with me at Dr. RP Center Ames. And he will be speaking on uh, retinal surgery in pediatric RDs and hereditary vitreoretinopathy. Thank you, Dr. Share, for the kind introduction. So I'll be taking you uh, along with uh, a few surgical scenarios pertaining to pediatric retinal detachments and hereditary vitreo retinopathy. So if we broadly see the pediatric retinal detachments can have various etiologies and it could be traumatic or congenital anomalies which Dr. Shorev will be speaking about. And uh, then it could be cataract surgery related complications or IL related complications, hereditary vitreo retinopathies such as Stickler, Marfan, excellent retinoschisis, and then there could be abnormalities of retinal angiogenesis, such as ROP and FEVR, in which ragmatogenous retinal detachments are known to happen. So coming to the cases, it's a 10-year-old male who had an open globe injury three months back, repaired corneal laceration with lens aspiration and uh, multi-piece IL in sulcus. Now he presented with a dropped IL with ragmatogenous retinal detachment and large infratemporal tear. And we took the patient for surgery. So there is a lot of corneal scarring is there, which will uh, impair the visualization. And circling element is placed, keeping in mind the vortex vein position. And the sclerotomies are made a little anterior here at 3 mm. Just And the direction of the sclerotomies is also more anterior as compared to the mid vitreous cavity. And there is a total retinal detachment with a dropped IOL, and there is a large temporal tear. So first you perform a port side vitrectomy, and a core vitrectomy is then done. Now it is important to identify the posterior haloid sheet, and so it is advisable to use a P uh, tricot. And under high magnification, you are able to uh, induce the PVD. Then you extend the PVD all around and then remove the vitreous. But here we note that in the inferotemporal part, there is a shatic vitreous sheet which is still left. So I'm here using a DDMS to scrape it off. And I'm able to gradually, with patients, you, have, you, you need to keep patients. And then the membranes are removed in the area of the break. And under indentation, vitreous base is shaved. The break margins are diathermized and they are freshened if required. And if in such scenarios where there is high risk of post-operative PVR, I often do ILM peeling. Now, I have, for haptic tuck-in, needle track is made diagonally opposite, and then sclerotomy is made, and then the intraocular lens is lifted using the cutter itself. It is brought into the mid uh, anterior vitreous cavity, and using the forceps, the haptics are exteriorized and tucked into the stellar retinal. 
Now the IOL looks stable. And following this, fluid air exchange is done. And the retina is flattened. And then under air, after flattening the retina, you adjust the final tire and perform laser and put silicone oil at the end of surgery. So here we can see the in good indent being appreciated in this quadrant with the brake lying on the indent. And then silicone oil is being put. Another case of post-closed globe injury with a history of operated lensectomy, a 12-year-old male patient with anterior vitrectomy done elsewhere. Now the patient has a superior iris defect in the superior five clock hours with a fakia and a retinal detachment with giant tear and giant retinal dialysis. So again, there is, since there is superior iris defect, we had planned a silic, uh, proline retention sutures in this patient. This is a large supranasal giant retinal dialysis, which is visible. And there is a choroidal rupture also at the posterior pole. Or after completing, after inducing the PVD here, we have injected the tricot and again checked for the residual hyaloid sheets. And again, we have using BBG also to confirm the same. Localized peritomy is done. And then 90 proline suture is used to create a meshwork in in the supranasal part because you are going to put oil and that is going to come anteriorly if there is no superior iris diaphragm. So here proline suture is being used and two vertical and two horizontal sutures have been placed to create the meshwork. So you can see the beautiful meshwork which is there and it does prevent the silicone oil from coming forward. This is followed by the PFCL in, uh, insertion to flatten out the retina and laser and followed by PFCL oil exchange. A third case, a, a patient, 16-year-old patient with marfanoid habitus with bilateral iris crawl lenses. Left eye had a disenclaved IOL from one side and a regmatogenous retinal detachment. So we have put an encircling element to 40 band. And now we can see there is a lot of PVR which is there, a lot of puckers in all the quadrants. After, remove, after doing the core vitrectomy and inducing the PVD, now we are using the end grasping forcer to remove these puckers gently. So once that is done, then the puckers are also released from the dialysis, which is there, large dialysis which could be visualized when the margins are freshened after diathermy. And now we are tightening the encircling band here and FX is done and the retina is flattened and laser is done. Case four is a 30-year-old male and patient had bilateral retinal detachments with an optically empty vitreous on slit lamp examination with multiple rows of lattice degenerations in both the eyes. And in the left eye, there was a retinal detachment. We were able to manage that eye with the scleral buckle, but within the right eye, we could not find a definite break. So we took the patient for an encircling element plus buckle plus vitrectomy surgery. The patient was pseudophagic. So in the mid-periphery, you can see there is a sheet of vitreous which is firmly adherent and uh, anteriorly the retina seems atrophic, although it was vascular, not avascular in the periphery. So PVD is induced and it is extended as much as possible. And here you can see it is stuck and we cannot go beyond the mid-periphery. So now tricot is used and this ring is identified and it is segmented and shaved, taking care not to create any break. You may be tempted to pull this ring with the help of uh, forceps, but you have to, you, you need to be cautious as a vigorous pulling hair, like in this case, had resulted in a break in fairly. In certain situations, you can go to an anterior to posterior approach, go anterior to that area of uh, lattice degeneration rows and remove the vitreous anterior to it. Sometimes you are able to find a plane between the vitreous and the retina in that area. And it is important to uh, remove all the traction around the brakes. So the brakes are uh, diathermized and then the... Now we are tightening the scleral buckle here. We had placed loose knots before and now we have tightened it. And after fluid fluid exchange, fluid air exchange is done and we can beautifully see the indent inferiorly, which is a very broad indent that we have achieved because we wanted it. And this is how it is in looking in the post-op period, that in such cases in which we are not able to extend the PVD, we can, uh, in the pre-operative period also, we can uh, identify characteristic that could indicate such a thing. And uh, we should achieve a good broad indent in such patients in the inferior areas as well as temporal part we have given the indent here. Now another case in which 
uh, there was bilateral retinal detach uh, unilateral retinal detachment in the right eye, but uh, the other eye had features of FEVR with the peripheral avascularity and fibrovascular proliferation. So right eye had stage 4A and left eye had stage 2A FEVR. And in the left eye we did laser, but in the right eye there was a ragmatogenous retinal detachment and a lot of subretinal bands were there. So again I wanted to show that a good indent is required in these patients because again you are not able to remove the vitreous thoroughly because the PVD will stuck at the junction of the vascular and avascular retina and if you try to attempt it further it will lead to inadvertent break formation. So the key aspects in managing patients with pediatric retinal detachment and HVR is that wherever possible plan alternative treatments to VR because you will have proliferative vitreous retinopathy happening in the post-operative period which will lead to redetachment. So if it is possible, you can laser delimit RDs or you can prefer scleral buckling in those patients. If you are going for VR, always use an encircling element and even in hereditary vitreous retinopathies, you can consider a broader support in, uh, by using a broad buckle. You, can, you should manage cataract wherever it is necessary to provide you a good view during the surgery as well as a thorough vitreous base excision. Tricot should be used to identify any sheets which would be left behind even if you are sure that there is a V's ring then also I sometimes do inject tricot to look for any residual hyaloid which would have been there. And if you are not removing that, then surely that would lead to proliferative retinopathy in the post-op period and re-detachments. Be prepared that in HVR cases, you will encounter in incomplete extension of PVD. So use a broad buckle in those cases and do a thorough shave with retinal. ILM peeling should be done, can be done in certain scenarios in which you are expecting a lot of PVR to happen, especially the post-traumatic cases. And silicone oil tamponade is must in these eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Devesh. Great videos. So i just like to add that uh, whenever, as he said, that we have cataract with a retinal detachment and we are planning to go in for a lensectomy, we can probably make our port straight away at 3 mm rather than actually making it at 4 mm. Go straight into the lens and eat it up. So that is much easier. Apart from that, he all he was continuously mentioning that we are not able to, you know, extend the PVD, which is quite true in such cases. So one additional thing that you can do is probably put in PFCL and try to, you know, come at the edge of the PVD and then try to lift it. It might just go a little bit further, but obviously once it does not go and there is a risk of making a break, then you should just rest the case and probably just shave it off and give a good buckle indent as he's done. And uh, apart from that, Ma'am, can you come to the mic and... Whether that silicone oil uh, will be prevented from yes, coming? Yes, yes, it is prevented. I didn't share the OCT video in the oh. post-op period, but in the OCT once also you can Once it is emulsified, make... it will come anteriorly, ah, Once no? it is emulsified, it will come. And from uh, where exactly you will pass this uh, tensoroproline? So tensoroproline has to be passed in the area where the iris diaphragm is, in the residual area. You can, you can have a look what, where it is. And normally you can pass it at 1 mm behind the, uh, this thing, aura, uh, behind the limbus. Will you remove it after once silicone oil is... Uh, no, it need not be removed, but yes, yes uh, it can become lax. That is what I have noted. I have done in a couple of patients, but it becomes lax, and in one of the patients, it break all, It did break also. So I had to remove in that case. Thank you. Okay, due to paucity of time, we will move on to the next talk. Uh, the next talk will be given by Dr. Shreyas, and he'll be talking about retroretinal surgery in complex TRDs. Shriyas is presently working as an assistant professor at JIPMER. Good afternoon all uh, management. So this will be the outline of my presentation. So when should you operate uh, tractional cases in uh, proliferative retinopathies? A TRD involving or threatening the fovea, a combined RD, and in cases where we have vitromacular traction, vitropapillary traction, ERM or uh, thick dot posterior hyaloid causing significant vision loss. So when not to operate, not all membranes in proliferative retinopathies uh, require surgery. An extramacular TRD, one eight patient with preserved macula, or a poorly motivated patient, surgery need not be attempted. So systemic control is very much important when you are planning uh, these surgeries because they are all complex surgeries, they might require a lot of time. So the most important is that the patient should be properly counseled regarding the visual acuity gains and uh, patient motivation is the most important thing. 
So certain things need to be considered before planning surgeries in these complex cases. Uh, we have to check for uh, corneal clarity, presence of uh, iris neovascularization, the adequacy of midriasis, the lens status if there is any cataract. If there is some dense vitro vitreous hemorrhage in the retrodental or the burger space, so better to plan cataract surgery because this can uh, uh, cause problem during visualization in our vitrectomy surgeries. Coming on to fundus assessment, uh, posterior hyaloid assessment is the most important thing uh, in these cases. It gives an idea regarding the site of initiation of our dissection. We have to assess the FEPs with regards to whether they are flat or raised. Flat FEPs are more surgically challenging. Uh, better to plan uh, bimanual surgeries in these cases. If there is a lot of vascularity, better to consider pre-op anti -vegifs. If there is a convex or bullous configuration, presence of fixed folds or subretinal bands and subretinal bleed, these are pointers towards uh, co uh, combined RD. And if the RD is extending beyond equator, it is better to support with belt and buckle. So if there is presence of sclerosis vessels and disc valor, it carries post-op poor uh, visual gain, and this has to be explained to the patient. So coming to few ancillary investigation, so OCT is extremely useful when we have a clear media to assess the vitro-retinal anatomy. A horizontal multiraster scan through the disc and macula can visualize, uh, can give details of both disc and macula. So these are some of the few examples which you can see here. Uh, you can see a thick dot uh, posterior hyaloid. You can see presence of uh, multifocal uh, vitro macular traction, presence of uh, neurosensory detachment or the uh, macula is detached in this case. In this case, you can see there is this shysis around the disc as well as the disc is lifted up. So you can also, uh, OCT is the only investigation which will tell you about presence of vitro papillary traction as you, see, as you can see in both of these cases. Ultrasound B-scan is very much uh, essential in these cases. It is useful with uh, dense media opacities. Even in clear media cases, it helps us to understand regarding the posterior hyaloid status and uh, presence of traction, whether it is tent-shaped, which uh, suggests it's a focal traction, or a tabletop, which suggests that it's a broad traction. So surgical goals will be clearing the media, relieving the traction, and to regress the FEP, we have to do endolaser. So first, we have to understand surgical anatomy before planning surgeries in these cases. So the most important thing we have to understand in proliferative retinopathy is, is that there exists two tractions, okay? So these vascular fronts grow from the retina to the posterior hyaloid and form a membrane which causes tangential traction and causes pleat-like folds on the retina. And there is one more event which happens there. There is an attempt to PVD, but uh, PVD is never complete in these cases. This causes anteroposterior traction, causing a cone of vitreous, and this leads to vitromacular traction and tractional retinal detachment. So goal of surgery in TRD is to relieve these two tractions. First is to relieve the anterior posterior traction by cutting off this incomplete PVD. And the second one is to relieve the tangential traction, which are caused by these membranes by either segmentation or delamination. So coming on to basic steps of surgery in TRD, most of the steps are common to other types of VR surgeries. But the two steps which are important here is relieving the anterior posterior traction and dealing with the tangential traction. So coming on to dealing with the AP traction, so we have to first identify the areas of uh, hyaloid separation. Sometimes you can get a gap in the hyaloid, otherwise we have to create it. Then we have to go circumferentially to truncate that cone which I already discussed. So that first we take care of the anteroposterior traction. So in some cases, it will not be very, uh, it will not be easy to induce, uh, uh, to cut open the posterior hyaloid. In such cases, visco dissection can be attempted. Or in this case, the cutter is not able to uh, make an opening in the posterior hyaloid. So we are using a 24 gauge needle through a 23 gauge uh, port to create an opening in the posterior hyaloid. And subsequently, the cutter is then introduced to circumferentially cut the vitreous. So now we have dealt with the anterior posterior traction, we have to deal with the tangential traction. It can be done with two approaches, outside in approach and the inside out approach. Outside in approach is most commonly followed. Here the dissection starts at or posterior to the vascular uh, arcades and then comes towards the optic nerve. Inside out approach is less commonly used. It, here the dissection starts from the optic nerve and then uh, progresses towards the periphery. Most of the times we will be using combination of these approaches. As you can see in this picture, the dissection is starting from vascular arcades and then progressing towards the disc. This is an outside-in approach. So coming on to techniques of membrane dissection, we have commonly used techniques, segmentation, delamination, and less commonly used end block technique. What happens in segmentation? Here, the membranes are cut into smaller islands. It can be done both with the cutter as well as with the scissors. 
cutters are most commonly used where we don't have any space to access these membranes so as you can see here most of the things can be dealt with the cutter itself when we don't get space we can actually introduce one of the blades of the cutter beneath the membrane and then segment the membranes so delamination involves complete removal of the membranes from the retinal uh, surface it can also be done both with the cutters as well as with the scissors there are various techniques of uh, cutter delamination the first one we see here it's most commonly used the fold back technique so here the cutter is placed above the membrane and vacuum is used to aspirate separate the membranes and then cut it is useful for loose membranes as you can see in this case so the next technique is the lift and shave uh, technique this is used for densely adherent membranes here the cutter edge is placed under the membranes space is created the membranes are gently lifted up and then cut so most oftenly we will be using combination of these techniques so n block dissection is less commonly used usually it is performed using uh, bimanual chandelier uh, assisted uh, techniques here the large sheet of fibrous tissue is removed bimanually here one hand uh, holds the membrane with the forceps and the other hand uses uh, scissors to cut these uh, small fibrovascular fronds so coming on to last to finish uh, management of combined rd combined rd is the procedure will be the same first we have to deal with the anterior posterior attraction so as you can see here we are going all around to cut that uh, cone of uh, vitreous fraction which is created by the uh, vitreous partially detached vitreous then segmentation of these membranes are done so careful peripheral vitrectomy has to be done in these cases especially if there is associated pvr the membranes are then segmented here there is a tendency for us to aspirate srf but this has to be dealt only at the end so sometimes you can have iatrogenic breaks uh, breaks but that will not deter our surgical outcomes that even it sometimes can actually help to relieve the traction so then diathermy is performed around the breaks laser is uh, first actually you have to do fluid fluid exchange because the srf is thick in these cases and it can be actually easily taken out when the fluid is there then subsequently perform fae then silicon oil tamponade is uh, mostly done in these cases to so to summarize ap traction is uh, dealt first by, by truncating the cone of hyaloid tangential traction is then dealt by either segmentation or delamination in combined artists we have to remember that we have to free all the traction around the breaks and srf is mostly drained only at the end of the surgery thank you thank you shreesh for the great videos now uh, i just like to add over here that basically when you are going in for a uh, diabetic tractional detachment or any tractional detachment it's basically three steps that you have to do first step is to if there is any loose blood that is there behind the sub hyaloid space the first would be to make a opening into the hyaloid which is there and try to do it on the nasal side and then try to aspirate all of that blood so that the retina beneath it becomes visible and you start seeing the planes better so that is the first step that you do once you have made a break Uh, opening in the hyaloid then you can make it 360 degrees so that that now it is totally separated from the anterior to the posterior portion then you go straight to the disc and try to delineate the disc and the plane that you will find will be mostly between the fovea and the disc is where the plane will be and once you insinuate your cutter cutter is a very good instrument for all these surgeries and you can simply just make an opening if it is not coming with a cutter you can probably just pick on it with a uh, your ilm or Uh, what do you call end grasping forceps make an opening delineate the disc and then you can go to the arcades and try to do segmentation so that is how you conquer and then in the end if you think that there is a pvd that is there because of shysis that might be there you can actually try to uh, extend the pvd till anteriorly that's only if you can do it safely so that are the three steps that generally i follow for all these uh, tractional detachments and uh, I do not use by manual, but uh, I don't know, sir, if you. Yeah, uh, on two points, I think one thing I like to say is uh, especially diabetic vitrectomy is uh, one of the reasons for you know PVR and failure is uh, residual vitreous. So I go in always early as a rule of thumb, use tricot because very often even sometimes when you have a clean removal, when you stain again, you'd be surprised to find some islands there. So vitreous cases is something which is there, especially if the diabetic is chronic, and most of us see that. also about over about bimanual so if you're assessing and it's a very chronic rd if you have decided that bimanual may be required it is better to go in early rather than go with unimanual get a break and then go in for bimanual so bimanual actually can 
<laughs> for a long time when we had uh, advanced uh, unimanual cutting systems, especially when the 10,000K came in with the bevel, and that's a great advantage. I don't think that 10,000 is a great advantage. I think the USP is more the bevel which helps you get into those tiny spaces. But then that said, uh, so there was a period of time when I was doing almost 100% unimanual for years. But then after that, I realized that, you know, sometimes I was moving to bimanual after I was getting it. Break. So the smart thing to do actually is to go into biomedical before you get these breaks and actually you will find that your surgery is faster and more efficient when you go in a little early and you can of course definitely avoid breaks. One small thing is that uh, when you don't get a plane and you have to use other instruments, you can use the proportional uh, reflux uh, a feature of a particular machine. I don't have any financial interest and you can create a space and go with that bevel and uh, do your cutting. Also, the valve cannula that we have is a great boon for actually diabetic attachments because it stops the bleeding. Before, when we had 20 gauge or 23 gauge cannulas, as soon as we used to change our instruments, we used to start oozing, and by the time we used to go in with the diatherm, you could not see the bleeder. So, at least with these, this is a very well maintained chamber, and we can easily diathermize. So, that's also a boon. Anyways, due to positive time, we'll go to the next talk. So, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sangeeta Roy. She is a dear friend and she was uh, with us as an SR and a GR, and now she is uh, having her own hospital here in Kolkata. So she'll be giving a talk on uh, surgical management in macular pathologies. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be presenting few uh, surgical cases. Just I'll just go through few surgical cases, and I will just tell a uh, few points as I go through the uh, steps. So this is a case of, ep of an epiretinal membrane. As you can see, there is almost a macular pucker over there. So this is a case of idiopathic ERM, and this patient received multiple injection of um, anti vegf before coming to me. And as you can see, that it is a uh, full pucker now. and. Uh, so after uh, checking for uh, PVD, <clears throat> I injected BBG dye. And as you can see, it is a very sticky membrane. And as I was trying to lift up the membrane, the whole, uh, uh, whole retina, whole macula was uh, coming out. So I tried an, a circumferential approach where I tried to do it from a more circumferential uh, area. and. Uh, and then slowly come towards the fovea. I just did the cataract surgery before, so uh, the, uh, the media is a bit haze. So all around the macula, I picked up the ERM and brought it near the macula. Here I was trying to uh, relieve it from the macula, but as you can see that almost the foveal uh, pigments, they were uh, coming off. So I stopped here and uh, I went from the other side and uh, peeled the membrane and it, then it came off. And then, as usual, uh, injected the dye again. Uh, peeled the, most of the ILM, it comes out with such a sticky ERM. But uh, if anything is left, then uh, we take out. And definitely, there was a bit, a bit of uh, vitreous sticking here or there. I removed all those parts. I tried to do a big ILM peeling in ERM cases also. And did air fluid exchange and closed it. So uh, if, if somebody is diagnosing a case as a just as an idiopathic ERM, I don't think anti vegf is a very good idea because I've seen if uh, people give uh, anti vegf in these cases, people land up to us uh, with a very sticky and a macular, uh, a very sticky membrane and a macular pucker kind of a picture. Uh, this is a case which is a macular hole RD. This is a high myo patient. The first patient presented to me as a case of macular hole. I advised surgery, but the uh, patient didn't get the surgery at that time. And then the, after 15 days, patient landed up in a macular hole RD. So in these cases, we know vitreoshysis is very uh, prominent. And I looked for uh, the uh, PVD here. And then uh, PVD had already occurred, but I will show you later. Uh, then I injected uh, dye and started ILM peeling. Here the retina was a bit elevated, so reaching the retina was not very much difficult for me, as Kaushik already uh, told in the first talk. I could reach the retina very well. And I, as I was peeling the temporal part of the uh, macula, I saw that there was a thin layer of uh, vitreous sticking over there. So these are the, uh, these are the vitreoshysis layers that we should be uh, careful about in doing my, uh, myopic cases. Then I slowly took my cutter and with, uh, with low uh, suction I induced the PVD and then I did my ILM peeling. Here I plan to do a 
inverse peel because in these cases the RP is not very good and uh, I was uh, not very sure I didn't want any recurrence in this case so I uh, did, an, uh, did an inverted uh, peel in this case. And so uh, yeah, many people say that we can leave it here, put gas and leave it here. I was not very confident. I did rem uh, uh, remove the subretinal fluid. And since the patient was one-eyed, I put oil in this case. So in myopic cases, it is very important to look for the PVD multiple times. If required, we should inject the, uh, if we should inject a tricot multiple times, uh, it is of no harm. And then I put oil here. So this is again a case of myopic macular hole. I have, it is a simple macular hole. I am showing this case to show the difficulty of uh, inducing PVD in this case. This is an 80-year-old old patient where we expect the PVD to happen very easily. But I really had a difficult time inducing the PVD. As you can, I'm sorry. As you can see, I tried all my instruments. I tried my cutter. And now I am trying uh, to induce it with uh, the extrusion. I again uh, put a tricot, and then I am trying to induce the PVD. So I tried all the all the things that I have learned from our te uh, from my teachers in RPC. Everything I tried, and finally I could uh, induce the PVD. And uh, after injecting uh, dye, I started doing the ILM peeling. Here, as you can see. The contrast is not very good, so many people uh, do the ILMs, uh, do the staining under air. I, I do it under fluid. In this case, it was a little bit difficult to visualize the ILM, but I could manage it. So again, uh, with this video, I just wanted to tell, use tricot multiple times, whatever the age of the patient might be. You might think that PVD has occurred, but still uh, stain twice, thrice to see whether uh, the PVD has occurred or not. I did air fluid exchange and then put gas. So this is a case of a traumatic macular hole. Uh, it was a blast injury which happened around three months back. I generally wait for three months in traumatic holes. Uh, there was a, a vitreous hemorrhage and a little bit of sub-macular uh, hemorrhage. It was a large hole. So after inducing, so here I uh, planned uh, an inverse peel uh, technique. Uh, visual prognosis was uh, nicely explained to the patient. So I tried to do a large ILM peel here and uh, put the ILM back on the macular hole. So in these kind of traumatic cases, it is very important to explain the patient about the visual prognosis because uh, even if the macular hole closes, the visual prognosis is very poor. Uh, these, they don't behave like idiopathic macular holes. And this is my last case. It is a case of a submacular hemorrhage. The patient uh, presented with a ruptured ram with a premacular and submacular hemorrhage. So here, after inducing the PVD, Uh, when I tried to remove the blood, I realized that it was a sub-ILM hemorrhage, so I did an ILM peeling uh, on the ma uh, over the macula. Here the ILM is elevated, so uh, ILM peeling is quite easy in these cases. And after that, I removed th this part was a, a little bit of cl clotted, uh, clotted blood around the uh, ram. And uh, this is the sub-ILM part, which I removed with the help of extrusion. Then I tried to remove that, uh, that clotted, uh, uh, clotted blood with the help of cutter. I, I went with a very, very low vacuum, and uh, I tried to trim it out. 
and then I went with a 41 gauge needle uh, with a cocktail of air and uh, and uh, TPA. I didn't use anti vegf here because there was no subretinal membrane here, and I injected uh, air and uh, the TPA in, uh, subretinally. Put uh, air, uh, put uh, gas and just close the case. Uh, in this case, the blood, uh, it is just seven days, uh, operated seven days before. The blood has already been displaced. But there is, a display, uh, there is a dispersed bleed in the vitreous cavity. So the patient has to be informed about that. We, we can remove the subretinal blood, but it might come in the vitreous cavity, which can be uh, dealt with later on. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Sangeeta. You truly are a great surgeon. So. So now, uh, I'd just like to add over here that uh, I'm not right, because we don't get the depth perception and we don't even see the edges of the PVD near the, near the disc. So I feel that it should only be attempted with the contact lens. So the landers is the way to go for trying to do a PVD. Secondly, when she was talking about ERM, so these ERMs that are there can actually be just ERMs or can be hyaloid as well as cellular hyaloid. So any particular points where you can differentiate if it is an ERM or a... This kind of pucker, if it is there, it is an ERM. And uh, in case, I, I had one more case because of shortage of time, I didn't show that. There was a case where the, there was a thickened uh, hyaloid. In those cases, the moment you stain the vitreous, you can easily realize the moment you uh, pick up the uh, PVD, uh, you see that uh, the, the membrane is gone from the macula. So that's true. So that is during the surgery. If you want to see it preclinically, then you probably will try to find an edge of the ERM, which might be there in a case of an ERM and not be there in case of a hyaloid. So once you go in and you try to do a PVD, the hyaloid will come with your PVD, whereas the ERM will remain. That's another thing. And she was, she again said when we were doing a macular hole detachment, we tried to stuff in the, uh, the uh, um, ILM inside the hole, which I feel is the right way to go because of the fact that even these macular hole detachments have a recurrence rate of, you know, redetaching. And in those cases, we probably have to go in and do a laser around the hole. So rather than doing something that traumatic, it's better to actually go in and stuff the hole. And probably I think that is going to give better surgical success. And uh, for giving TPA any particular, uh, you know, um, way how you can safely give the TPA. Uh, first, we have to use either a 41 gauge or a 39 gauge needle. Again, we have to go through uh, a contact lens uh, where you can uh, not the wide angle lens because you need a good stereopsis. And you have to find the area where I, I generally do it inferiorly, uh, just uh, inferior dependent part I uh, do it. And I inject slowly because if you inject very fast, then you can land up in a macular hole, especially uh, in cases where there's a CNVM, there can be irregular attachments. Uh, in those cases, they, you can land up in a macular hole. And uh, yeah, slow, uh, slow pushing is the so key, she, actually. She's right. That's how you should give. And preferably, you should not press on the cannula because if you're pressing on the cannula, it's actually pressing on the RP. And it will not, you will not be able to inject. You just have to put it over the retina and then inject, and it will split the layers and it will go subretinally. So that is the trick. And Any one more thing is sometimes in uh, cases where the CNVMM subretina, you take anti VEGF, then you take TPA, and then you take air. So it becomes very, uh, very uh, difficult, cumbersome to uh, control the piston. And I am not comfortable my assistant pushing any injection inside the retina, inside the, uh, yeah, inside the retina actually. So what we can do is, since it is a 41 gauge needle, it doesn't cause any harm. So you can inject one drug and then take it out and then go again with the other two things. That's Thank it. you. Thank you, Sangeeta. So I'll call up the next speaker. Uh, so, Dr. Nawazish will be speaking on managing failed vitreoretinal surgery. Dr. Nawazish is uh, a research officer with us at Dr. RB Center Ames. Good afternoon, everyone. So, I'll be presenting on how we do we manage failed vitreoretinal surgeries. Uh, because of paucity of time, I'll be breezing through some of my slides. So, what is primary failure? Primary failure is when the surgery fails at the first time. Uh, at the time of surgery, the retina fails to attach. Secondary failure would be subsequent detachment after a period of attachment. Secondary failure would further be divided into early redetachment, which would be presenting within six weeks. So maximum 80% of our cases usually present at this time. Late redetachment would be presenting any time beyond six weeks. It could be as late as many years after.
after surgery. So there are different rates of failures in different surgeries depending upon the population they have taken, the multiple factors such as the type of tear, any other complicated part of it, uh, open globe injury, giant retinal tears, all of these would contribute to changes in the number of uh, rate of uh, failure. But we can say that roughly up to 10% of cases do require additional interventions. So what are these risk factors for failure? Why is it important for us to know is because as surgeons we need to plan the surgery. We should know beforehand what steps we are going to take, what to anticipate and the ways to overcome those. And for the patient it's to basically explain the possibility that they might have suboptimal outcomes, they might require another surgery. So it's better to, be, uh, to explain the patient much beforehand and well in advance what could happen to them the surgery. So again, risk factors could be preoperative and perioperative. We know that PVR status such as PVR grade C and worse or anterior PVR may lead to uh, failure. Retinal breaks, large sizes of breaks, more than three disc diameters or presence of a macular hole. As Dr. Kaushik rightly pointed out, high myopes, staphylomyitis eyes, these patients have vitrochiasis which may again lead to failure. Choroidal detachment, hypotony, long duration of RD and total RD can uh, cause inflammation in the and lead to advanced PVR. Perioperative factors would be inability to complete PVD, so any presence of vitrochiasis will allow a membrane to remain and a scaffold for the, uh, infl uh, for the proliferation to happen over. Incomplete vitreous base removal, inadvertent break formation, inadequate tamponade, especially in patients with inferior RD and inferior breaks, lack of positioning. So any patient with an inferior break where we're using a, uh, our conventional silicone oil which has a specific with gravity, less than water would make the oil bubble float on top, on top, allowing a small fluid at the bottom, which would again allow for proliferation of uh, uh, membranes in that area. So what are the causes of failure? The main causes of failure are PVR, vitreous based traction and inadequate treatment of breaks, formation of new breaks or undetected breaks. So case one is basically revision surgery following oil removal. So this was a patient who was operated elsewhere. Young patient presented to us with one pucker at the retinotomy site, which was close to the disc and an inferior open break. So we went ahead, did a silicone oil removal. At the time of silicone oil removal, we noticed that there's some membranes at the posterior pole. We went ahead, removed the pucker. At this time, we noticed that PVD induction had not occurred during the primary surgery. So while the pucker was being removed, PVD induction began and we extended it beyond. After which we ensured that clearance was done from the break using a cut, uh, using a 25 gauge cutter, a DDMS diamond dust and membrane scraper from Tano's. Following which again we used an ILM forceps, ensured all membranes are clear from the break. And we did a fluid air exchange from the same retinotomy and uh, retreatment of the break was done. Second case, this patient, the revision was done under oil. Patient presented with a posterior pucker. Removal was done under oil. At the same time, retinotomy was drained by creation of, uh, sorry, SRF was drained by creation of a retinotomy. Bimanual aspiration was done. I don't have any financial uh, uh, basically disclosures, but this is possible only with the constellation system. At the time of So at the time of drainage, we noticed that the break was lifted and then we went ahead with the relaxing retinectomy and augmented the laser around the break. So the third case actually presented to us 10 years after the primary surgery. There was presence of residual hyaloid, which we went and removed. Membrane peeling was done due to presence of extensive membrane at the posterior pole. Despite all this membrane peeling and ILM peeling, the retina was stiff and taut. We had to do a relaxing retinotomy, followed by, again, endolaser under PFCL and PFCL air exchange, followed by oil insertion. The fourth case presented to us with an inferior retinal detachment and uh, the retina was tented because of a subretinal band present inferiorly which had to be removed. Diatomy was done and the subretinal band was removed. Now in an important thing to notice over here is that this is a myopic patient, thin retina. If you pull on the band too much, you might linearly tear the break, the retina, sorry. Then fluid air exchange was done followed by 
endolizer augmentation. Case 5 presented with an anterior loop traction. So what we did for this case was that insinuated the 25 gauge cutter because of its small size it could easily fit into that trough and went around circumferentially separating the membranes from the vitreous base. So what are the adjuvants to management over here? So we can use an encirclage, especially in, if in the first surgery we have not used an encirclage and uh, it, the redetachment has occurred with an inferior RD. We can use PFCL. The point of PFCL is that it gives us adequate counter traction for membrane peeling. Uh, Trepan blue dye, so what we normally use is uh, Brillin Blue G, 0.025%, uh, but it only, it's a vital dye, so it stains live tissue. Trepan blue after fluid air exchange would stain even these epiretinal membranes. Use of heavy oil, so the, our conventional silicone oils, the specific gravity is around 0.97, which is less than water, so it basically floats on water. Whereas a heavy oil would, like something like a Denseron, would have a specific gravity more than water, so it would settle down. So even in the, uh, even if a patient is sitting, the oil would tamponade the inferior retina. Other adjuvants could be in the form of anti-proliferative agents, something like the methotrexate, like methotrexate is under study using the GARD trial. Uh, they basically injected uh, methotrexate intravitrally over weeks. Total of 13 injections were given in their trial. Final results are awaited. But uh, the problem with this was that methotrexate can cause corneal toxicity. So what we did at RP Center was we did a pilot study in which we used methotrexate as an infusion at the time of primary surgery and repeated it at one and four weeks. So the summary slide is that preoperative assessment is the key, especially at the time of primary surgery as well as, the, as at the time of the revision surgery. If there is redetachment under air or gas, please consider use of silicone oil and circlage, and especially in cases of inferior RD. Redetachment under oil with anterior PVR, again, consider an encircling element or anticipate need of relaxing retinotomies and retinectomies. Redetachment under oil with no PVR but an open break, revision surgery with retreatment of break is required. Redetachment under oil with no PVR but inferior break. So uh, we do not need to always go for the VVR. We can place a buckle outside, do an external drainage and treat the, uh, treat the break using either a cryo or an LIO. Redetachment after SOR, do look for a missed break, break at port sites and revision surgery with SOI. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Navarish, Dr. Navarish. Dr. Navarish. Excellent uh, lecture. Now we'll go to the last speaker. Uh, Dr. Shaurya Azad will talk about uh, congenital anomalies and we are surgery in them. Shaurya is an excellent surgeon and right person to talk about this. Please, Dr. Shaurya. Uh, so basically congenital anomalies, uh, what we'll be talking about is uh, 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 choroidal colobomas and cavitary disc anomalies, which are basically morning glory, optic disc pit, and optic disc coloboma, peripapillary staphyloma. How to manage your cases with respect We don't go in for scleral buckling. Vitrectomy is the way to go in such cases. Preoperative lens status, as uh, others have mentioned, is very important because we want uh, an easy visibility in the surgery. Uh, putting a band or not is totally dependent upon uh, you, whether or not I, in IFC generally do not put a band, but I prefer to put bands in either where uh, there is extreme PVR or at least in cases where there is uh, it is, it's a fake patient. Uh, when you are planning the ports, well, ports can be planned according to uh, uh, the normal uh, limbus to aura distance, which is the same in these IFC eyes. This is not anything different. In a microphthalmic eye, maybe you can then try to gauge where you want to go in. Then uh, the steps of surgery, well, I'll just say that one is that you have to debulk the vitreous quite a lot during the core vitrectomy in cases of IFC because of the fact that it's a formed vitreous and there's lots to take out. So first you have to debulk the vitreous and you have to do quite a good amount of vitrectomy before you actually try to lift the PVD because otherwise the PVD would be heavy and you will not be able to lift. Second would be that there will be membranes that will be there on the in the uh, uh, vitreous, which you can clear, then get a more better view before you actually try to lift the PVD. And lastly, that you have to do actually a tricot assisted PVD, and preferably, as I said, that you want to do it under a contact lens, because contact lens is what gives you a good stereopsis, and you can 
lift the PVD much more in a controlled manner from a contact lens. And you have to realize this also that there is a vitreous that is there in the over the intercalary membrane as well. So when you are peeling it, sometimes if the vitreous is stuck onto that side, then probably it will be difficult for you to peel. In cases where you cannot do a PVD, then you move on to a forceps assisted PVD in which you can try to lift the PVD with the help of a forceps. So here, here we are trying to remove it with the forceps. Then when you extend the PVD, what you are supposed to do is that that you might have a retinal tug which is there because this vitreous is formed. And while doing a vitrectomy, you might end up making a break. So in those cases, you have to be very careful that you decrease your suction and then probably try to do it in a more controlled manner and keep your cutter port away from the retina. During the peripheral vitrectomy, you just don't go across the uh, lens because if it is a fake patient, you can change your hands. You can do the uh, uh, right, uh, left side vitrectomy with your left hand and the right side vitrectomy with your right hand. Breaks are mostly in the intercalary membrane or at the edge, so there's no uh, problem in lo localizing that. You can simply just go ahead with the air fluid exchange and put your cannula inside the coloboma and you will see the retina settling and then you can move on with your laser and putting oil. If you can't settle the retina, in those cases you can probably go and make a retinotomy and then move ahead. Then once you've done an air fluid exchange, there are quite a lot of membranes or that at the edge of the coloboma that are there and it would be better if you actually go there and cut these membranes. Try not to make a break but there is vitreous also attached to it so you want to shave that vitreous off so that post operatively does not cause any traction and any redetachments. For laser, uh, generally what I prefer is that we do a 360 degree laser and also do a laser around the coloboma sparing the macula and in cases of redetachment you can probably do a macula involving laser. So the next one is optic disc maculopathy. I'll not be taking much time on this. Basically the step that is important is there are a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, variations in PPV that one can have, whether it is with ILM peeling, without ILM peeling, whether it is with uh, laser, without laser, with gas, without gas, with stuffing, without stuffing. I'll not go into it. Basically what you have to do is that you have to uh, have a good knowledge of what exactly you are trying to do. So what is implicated is that anterior posterior traction is there that is actually causing, so PVD is probably a step that you need to do. And the next would be that while doing a ILM peeling, if you have decided so, you do it slowly so that you don't land up making a hole because some of these uh, ODMs are long standing and they have a very thin retina right in the center. They have lamellar, uh, outer uh, lamellar macular holes and you don't want to land up making a break. So that is something laser I do not prefer doing at the edge of the disc and gas is something that I put but it is again, it, it does not, uh, it's not shown in studies that it actually aids in anything. Stuffing it has been done with different uh, things. It can be done with a fibrin glue, it can be done with an ILM, it can be done as you can see that we are doing here with a scleral graft that is there. So we just make a partial thickness graft and then we go and stuff it into the... And the kind of outcome that you want, it takes time. It doesn't just come soon after the surgery. So and in cases of morning glory or peripapillary staphylomas, what you do is basically these breaks are there at the margin of the margin of the disc. And these might be obscured because the retina is very thin and there is some pigmentary changes over there. So what you need to do is you have to go and identify this break and then drain the fluid from there, do a good laser around it, and these, pa uh, these uh, patients tend to do better with silicon oil rather than gas. Thank you, I'll just conclude.
I would like to thank all the people who have stayed there, uh, stayed here, uh, for their patient uh, listening, and I would like to thank all the speakers who have taken part, and uh, thank you all.